Okay, we are live. Good, good. Uh, welcome you, all of you who are watching this, the first episode of what Steve and I are calling Who Let You In Here? Uh, a podcast where we talk to uh, interesting mavericks and authorities in certain fields and thought leaders of certain industries just to pick their brain and find out who let them in here who helped them get to the next level in their career how did they manage the pitfalls of their journey towards their dreams and their vision and uh mining their stories for some practical tips and tricks that you can perhaps use to better yourself in your career and uh, maybe even steve and i can do the same we need all the help we can get from time to time. So, uh, Steve, how are you, my man? Doing well? I'm doing well. There you have in there. Oh, yeah. For, oh, yeah. For the 4th of July weekend? The 4th of July weekend. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm ready in as much as uh, ready to social distance and uh, chill by myself and uh, with, with the lady uh, for the most part. Uh, not ready to go out and mingle in groups and, you know, be pulled on a tube with six other people, you know, with no masks and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, ready to, ready to enjoy a holiday, but also work because uh, there's things to be done. We've got a lot of irons in the fire uh, this quarter, but uh, tonight is about talking to our, our special guest, Mr. Matt Black, the bassist of every Avenue band that you and I had the, uh, the uh, fortune to, perform with uh, a couple days after Christmas in 2019 uh, talk about how we yeah. Uh, how we've done. yeah that was awesome good show quite quite yes uh, sounds like the uh, the neighbors are uh, working on their lawn next to you there Steve uh, well yeah a little suppose, bit yeah I suppose without further ado uh, let's bring mr. Matt black in to the uh, forum here Matt you there Ah, he's connecting to audio. Hey, there he is. Hello, hey. hello. How are you, sir? I am good. I am good. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thanks for being our, our first guest. And uh, also, I see thanks for repping the, uh, the Red you know Wings there. You know it. <laughs> right, on. right on. So you're coming to us from the Nashville area right now. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sunny Nashville. Whereabouts are you at? Uh, what's, what's the haps today down in Nashville? What does it look like? Paint a picture for us. Uh, today is sunny for the first time in about a week. We have been uh, dealing with rain and uh, a lot of clouds, so today's been nice. That's good. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, what's what's new and exciting on your end? Uh, you know, we've all been experiencing the. I don't know. I hate to call it fallout because it sounds like a nuclear war, but you know, <laughs> you know, for lack of a better term, the fallout of this whole pandemic. Uh, with COVID-19 and everything, you know, before we get into the nuts and bolts of how that's kind of affecting, you know, life as a musician and the you know, music industry as a whole, just uh, uh, what's, what new good things have come out of this for you uh, over the past couple months? Um, good things that have come out of it. I have been home enough to work enough that I have uh, paid off a lot of uh, debt. So that's good, I guess. Um, <laughs> one good thing, it's hard to really uh, think about good things that have come out of, out of this when so many people have it so rough. So, um, But I've had more time to spend with my family. You know, being home gives you more time to do that. And, and it's hard because you're still not supposed to be around people as much. But, you know, what are you going to do? It's family, so understood and in asking about you know any positives or good things it's it's not in any way to to take away from the negative aspects of what's going on or to make light of of anyone who who has suffered or knows someone who has suffered from this or or lost their life because of this it's not it at all it's just you know we're we're trying to always move things forward and so yeah for sure so, you know at the at the outset of this whole thing for the first couple of weeks, you know, few weeks or even the first month, there's a lot of trepidation and, 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 and worry and a lot of, uh, you know, people were really in crisis mode. And uh, frankly speaking from, from myself, most of the folks that I, that I have experienced uh, speak, speak 
spoken with and whatnot during this time, they're telling stories of how, yeah, at first they were really, really worried and all that and whatnot, but things have, have uh, proven out a little bit more favorably as they've gotten used to sheltering in place and, and dealing with all that stuff. How, what has, uh, if, if you don't mind, how has this affected you as a musician? Let's get into that because well um last show that i played was probably i want to say midway through february um and kind of when it all went down and when shows started getting canceled um i started um, i've been driving for like grubhub and doordash and just basically doing what i can to make money so i basically just full-time became that i know a lot of people when it slowed down they had nothing to do um so i guess i have been fortunate where i've been able to 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 do that um so yeah things i mean like for everyone else just kind of came to a screeching halt and um there were a few um organizations out there music cares and uh the uh the ACMs who were helping out, especially people here in Nashville who were in need, musicians in need who weren't working. And uh, so that's been really cool. Um, And I was able to do a, just this was two weeks ago now, um, a a charity kind of, kind of a show. There were like 30 or 35 musicians, kind of a mixed bag. And we all just kind of randomly rotated um, members of this band um, and played covers and it was a big thing for COVID relief so that was a cool thing to be a part of to kind of give back because you know Music Cares helped me out quite a bit um, when this all went down initially in in, uh, in March so. Was there um, what uh, what kind of artists were on there was it like all genres of music or? Um, mostly kind of from um, this scene that um, the band that I was in every Avenue um, kind of mostly musicians from that scene for the most part. Um, It was like guys from cartel and Bayside made a parade. Okay. Uh, Yeah. 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 Day to remember. So it was like, yeah, a lot of different bands, a lot of, a lot of bands from, uh, from that genre you know, at least one or two members of those bands live here in Nashville. It just kind of works out like that. Um, so there's always a few of us kicking around to be able to help out with things like that. So. Gotcha. Right, on. right on. Well, take us back. I mean, get, you know, forget right now, growing up, what got you into music in the first place? Um, you know, you're, you're at, the place in your journey where you are now, but there was a first step. What was, what was that first step for you? So, um, my mom is a singer. Um, and my dad runs her sound. So I've kind of had it around me my whole life. And, um, although I guess like playing a, an instrument never was really something I considered I was able to do until way later in life. Like I was always singing and um, so music was always a prominent part of my life, but it wasn't until almost after high school, basically, um, when actually like playing music seemed like it became more of a possibility. Um, And a lot of that came from actually from uh, Steven's band back then, uh, he and his brother had a band and I would go and, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of y'all's Kubrick's message, maybe. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and I would just go, I would just go and sit in their basement and watch them practice. And, uh, you know, you're just, you're sitting there and you're watching these guys that you know better than anyone else, they know you better than anyone. And you're like, if these guys can do it, like, why can't I do something like this? Like, not, That's what not. everyone says when they see Steve play. <laughs> the ultimate hey. everyman. Um, Probably. No, but, but it was, you know, they were doing it good. It wasn't like they were just like clunking away. They were good. And it was like, oh, okay. Like, 
I feel like this is something I could do. And I think I stole uh, a booklet that had tab for like all the bass lines from the first Rage Against the Machine album. And uh, basically went and bought a, you have a my book starter bass and... Uh, <laughs> Do you have my book still? I don't somebody, know. Somebody has my Rage Against the Machine bass tab book. I never got it back. <laughs> it's probably me. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to learn bass lines, that's a good place to start. So, You know, it's funny you say that. And, and since your dad is a sound engineer, that, that first, that debut Rage album is still used by audiophiles to oh, man. reference monitors and, and, and test, you know, monitor abilities. Cause that mix in, in, is, is tight. That production oh, yes. is tight. Andy Wallace and Bob Ludwig, man, you know, you're talking about two of the greats. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I mean, everything that they have put out sonically is, is pretty amazing. Like just sounds insane. So that's a band you can't mess with their tones. Of course. Yeah. Well, so seeing Steve and, and his brother, uh, who is also a continuing mus musician with uh, a sudden death syndrome, MC Motormouth, mm -hmm. he goes by. Uh, it's his moniker. Uh, so since seeing them, so what, then did you end up like forming your first band right after that? Did you just start tinkering around with an instrument? What, what was the next step? So I... Uh... Got in with a couple of buddies who needed a bass player and kind of were like, yeah, like, we'll show you what to do. Like, it's, it's not that hard. And um, I think a few of us wanted to do more than what a few of the other guys did. And so uh, the singer and I uh, found a flyer for a band out in Port Huron that needed a singer and a bass player randomly. Um, so we started driving back and forth to Port Huron basically every other day, uh, playing with this band called For the Taking up there. Dri um, driving back and forth from how far? Um, about an hour and a half. Not too bad. Oh, whoa. Where were you coming from, if you don't mind? From uh, Taylor, downriver, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a hike. All right. Continue. Sorry. A lot yeah. of, hey, a lot of people uh, wouldn't uh, drive for 90 minutes one way. To... um for for band practice every day yeah you'd be you'd be surprised how many people won't um <laughs> but yeah um i think with with that band it turned out our ambition was more than our talent <laughs> and um but uh but i i kind of just had that that drive from that from from those experiences that like this is really something that i can do if i if i really kind of put my mind to it and that band broke up and I wasn't really doing much. Um, I kind of, there was a band down in, in Pittsburgh. I was kind of driving down every weekend to Pittsburgh and playing with this band um, down there. And that wasn't really working out. And um, a band came to Detroit to shoot a music video and um they needed help shooting the video and my buddy um, had just kind of gotten in with this band. They were from uh, yeah, Richmond, Virginia. Um, and uh, so he got me to help out with the video and he had, um, he was kind of starting to manage them, kind of starting to book them and he needed help kind of just all around with everything. And uh, so we booked them a three month tour. This is like summer of 2005 now. Um, booked them a three month tour and that was like the first tour that I did. And I basically haven't stopped since then. <laughs> Where did you guys tour? Like a, like a, whole, like a region tour or? Uh, no, it was a full US. Um, and we had no idea how proper booking went and you know, <laughs> how if you book a 95 day tour, you might burn some people out and, you know, um, but yeah, we just, you know, we were 20 and going for it and uh, it was awesome. But yeah, it was, uh, it was three months. Uh, we were out with, with this band uh, or I was out with this band, I should say. And the whole time um, 
they were having conversations with, um, I want to say, Arista Records. Um, and just back and forth, and there was all these label negotiations going on and people coming out to shows. And um, at the end of the tour, um, it turned out that this all was a lie that the singer had made oh, wow. up. Um, yeah, and <laughs> was having uh, fake phone conversations and telling us all this crazy stuff. That's insane. Um, yeah, so that was my first touring experience was that. But um, but from those dudes, I met another band um, who needed a bass player down in Richmond called Race the Sun and joined that. And Was that the, was that the band... I remember, I remember not seeing you for a while, maybe for like a good year. Yeah, um, you know, like I was, I was still in high school. You know, I think I, it might have been my senior year of high school by then, mm -hmm. maybe junior year. I remember seeing a van and a trailer or something like that parked at your parents' house, and it had <laughs> it had that band name on the side of it. There's like I don't what was it like a like oh, a rainbow God, yeah. unicorn horse thing going on on the side of the trailer, and I'm like, what the hell is that? Yeah, we played a show in in San Antonio uh, at this place called the White Rabbit, and there were these guys who were tagging the outside of the building, uh, spray painting it, and uh, we stupidly were like, "Hey, you should like tag our name on the trailer. Like that would be a good idea." And then on the other side, just do whatever you want. And we didn't think about it till after that, like that you know, that we were now just a advertisement for robbery driving down the road <laughs> yeah <laughs> please take our shit yeah i've had i've had that being in in you know a few few bands with uh because you know, like i i own my own trailer and you know I, i've used it you know you know with john and i and and uh you know previous band i had uh and all the band members were like why don't we put our band name on it and i'm like because you're just inviting people to rip you off even more yeah I mean, it's like, hello, there's equipment in here. Take it, take it. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what I'm like, and you know, it took them a while to catch on. You know, I don't know why they didn't understand that. But, uh, hey, I didn't get it at first either, so <laughs> I can't talk too much shit. So how did how did you uh, end up playing bass with Every Avenue then? And and uh, you know, what was it what was it like? Uh, you know, starting out with that group, and then uh, I want to talk about uh, you know leading up to. Uh, working with Mitch Allen as a producer. Oh, all right, all right. So um, when I was in the band in Port Huron in For the Taking, uh, one of the guitar players was a guy named Josh. Um, and when For the Taking broke up, uh, Josh joined Every Avenue. And we had played shows with Every Avenue. Um, I mean, at this point, completely different lineup other than the singer Dave. Um, but so I went down... I was in Richmond for two years playing with Race the Sun, and when they broke up, um, well, right before they bro broke up, we were looking for a guitar player, and I hit up Josh in Michigan and said, hey, um, you know, I don't know what's going on with Every Avenue, but if it's nothing, you should come down to Richmond and, and join this band. And he was like, well... I don't know what's going on with that band, but you know, if something happens that's not good with that, Every Avenue might need a bass player. And so I kind of had a choice to make and um, I ended up going, this was the end of 2007. Um, ended up going back up, moving back to Michigan uh, and joining Every Avenue. So, and they had just, let's see. I think this summer, like maybe three or four months before, they had just signed um, with Fearless Records um, and recorded their first full length. So I kind of jumped on right when touring started uh, for the first full length with them. Um, oh, so you just like jumped right in there, pretty much. I mean, I was I was there for a few days. We went over the set and we were on the road. What did, uh, what did touring teach you about, you know, both being a musician and then about just yourself and maybe in life, you know, not to get, you know, all existential, but, you know, what, <laughs> what, what big, what big things did you take away from touring as extensively as you did right off the jump? 
and you were already out as a 20 year, year old, you know, yeah. it up. So yeah. you know, what have you um, self-reliance was a big one. Um, you know, I had only lived with my parents before that and before I moved right after that first tour. So anything that I wanted or needed, and I don't want to say anything, but you know, if you had a need, there was, there were people that you could ask if you needed money, there was someone that you could ask. And then going out on the road, you kind of realize that like you're out on your own and like, you really only have yourself to rely on to like, you have to sell merch or CDs so that you can get gas to get to the next show. So if you don't do it, no one else is, you know what I mean? So it's kind of, you learn real quick. Um, yeah, I think self-reliance was a big one. Um, but there are a lot of, of things that you pick up along the way, how to deal with people, how to be, how to be uncomfortable for long periods of time and not freak out about it. <laughs> comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah pretty much. Um, and especially doing van tours, um, my touring the first, I mean, almost 10 years were, were for the most part all in vans. So, you know, you, you really learn if you can get along with people in closed quarters and, um, how much patience you have. And so, yeah, but I, I knew, I feel like that my first like night on the road that that touring was for me and that was kind of the lifestyle that I was into. So I took to it quickly. Ditto. Ditto. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed on that. Uh, you uh, like from touring. Um, do you do you actually enjoy touring or just like, is there a specific uh, aspect of it that you like more than one thing? It's kind of the whole package for me. I just thoroughly, well, I enjoy taking trips. Um, I've always enjoyed taking road trips, going places, being on the road, the activity of actually going somewhere. Um, and then obviously playing shows is one of the most fun things that you could do. Um, so you combine those two things and you kind of, there's a little bit of like when you're out on the road, you kind of, you can duck responsibilities and a lot of like real life things that are, that are yeah. waiting for you at home. Um, so it's like a stress relief as well going out. Um, so yeah, I, I, I enjoy everything about it. Yeah, I, I, I agree on that. Uh, I think last time when, uh, you know, we were out on the road, uh, we were come, coming back from West Virginia. Was it, John? That's correct. West Virginia. Yeah, yeah like, I, I really didn't want to come back. I was like, I just want to keep going. But we didn't, unfortunately, we didn't have uh, enough time and, and other stuff booked up then at the moment. So, but... Uh, that, that's how I kind of felt on it. I was like, oh, I just kind of want to keep going. Yeah, right. I think I can do this for a while. Yeah. Yeah. That first tour that I did the, the three months without a break, I think I was the only person at the end of that that wasn't burnt. Like, I was like, I think I could keep going. Like, what I think I the, could do this actually. What was the Vans Warp Tour experience like for you? Oh, man. Insane. Um, and, and it's was, kind of who funny. Was the headliner, the, uh, who was the headliner that year? Who were the big dogs on the, on the circuit? So the first one that I did was in 06. And um, I want to say that was like under oath. Saves the day was out that year. 30 seconds to Mars. Shout out to Arun from Saves the Day. Yes, sir. My boy. He would also approve of this shirt. Yes, he would. Very much so. Um, yeah, that was 06 was the first year I did it. And that was doing it as about as rough as you can. You know, the van with no AC and nowhere to stay at night. And, and 
I don't know how many people realize Warp Tour is for for most people other than the really really big bands. Um, it's it's an all day thing that you're working. You're up at um, usually like 7 a.m. You're helping unload the trucks uh, to not really build the stage, but unloading the trucks so they can build the stage and um, then you're out promoting your band, trying to get people to buy CDs or listen to you or just wait, hustling. Wait, wait, wait. So you're, and say, then, you're saying that you're saying that unless you're, you know, a, a, for all intents and purposes, a payroll band on the Vans Warp Tour, if you're one of the supporting acts that you're required to part of the like the contract is that you have to help unload the trucks for setting up everything. Like, well, current? even the big bands, but usually the bigger bands have crew so they can have them, but, um, really, yeah, usually the stage will I've require that, like, that two wild. people right. from each, uh, band or crew is there every morning to help unload. And then once you're done, those two people break everything down and load back right onto the truck. That's if you're lucky enough to get a spot on the truck. So if you don't get a spot on the truck, then you're just pushing from your own trailer and you might be parked in a field two and a half miles from the stage and you're just pushing your equipment through that field. So uh, it's not a complaint to get up at seven and unload. It's actually, you're one of the, one of the fortunate ones. Um, but you know, the show's done at about eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock, something like that. And then, there is almost nightly there is a huge party and a barbecue uh, for all of the bands and then if you're on a bus you go to sleep and you wake up in the next town and if you're in a van you uh you go from that barbecue or you skip the fun part the barbecue and you just drive to the next town so you can be there at 7 a.m to load in um but yeah it's it's basically no sleep um and you're you're hitting it pretty hard um doing it in a van um so that was my experience in in 06 and then i did it with every avenue 08 09 and 11 and we were lucky enough those years to uh to have found other bands to share a bus with so we didn't have to rough it as bad those years um righteous right on Right on. And no, no, com no complaints on, on the, the, the scheduling or the grueling schedule. It just I, that I'd never heard that before. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's your, you are a part of making warp tour go. I think that's why I think it's great. When you, when you've like, even someone who goes out for two weeks, there's like this badge of honor that, that you wear after you've done warped and you're just like, yeah, like I went through it. I helped do this. Like you feel like you've been a part of something um and it's definitely cool to to have been in a band that's kind of associated with that because i looked up to the tour so much you know coming up growing up like that was such like a a staple of summer you know what i mean for everyone like yeah so Talk yeah to have been a part of that so many times is definitely a really cool thing no I, absolutely talk about uh talk about working with mitch allen you know he's he's written and produced you know music with you know undeniable you know top charting artists at, you know at yeah this point uh what did what did you learn from that experience how did it help yeah. you grow mitch is a pop music monster um songwriting producing engineering uh, he's insane um yeah we um you know, I'm trying to think this was 2009, summer of 2009, uh, we went out um, to LA big, for a few picture months. Picture Perfect album, right? Yeah, yep. Um, and we didn't really get the full band in the studio doing all of this together experience with that um, album because the studio that we were using was so small we could basically only have one or two people in there so we all kind of packed in for pre-production and then once i mean we only did pre-pro i mean maybe four or five days um and then once that was done i was kind of out of the the studio for the next month i hung out in the apartment 
and uh, got high while the guys went <laughs> and recorded. Um, so I actually didn't have, I didn't get a lot of, of FaceTime with Mitch. I had my, I think, day and a half where we did bass tracks, and uh, that was about it. But very cool dude. And uh, yeah, like I said, uh, dude's ear for pop music is just insane. That's cool. Right on. Uh, so what's what's happening right now with every avenue uh you know there was a, a hiatus for a while and then a reunion where you guys have been playing uh at least to my knowledge regional shows right in the yeah, yeah. upper midwest uh what what's going on with every avenue at this point and uh are you endeavoring in any other projects or efforts musically right now especially during the down the shutdown kind of times so as far as every avenue we don't we haven't really made any sort of real plans everything that has happened in the past uh, year and a half has kind of just come together randomly um it's proven we've tried to do a few things and it's it is very hard to get the five of us uh, to have our schedules meet up. Um, so we never know when things will go on, when they won't. Um, so I'm not sure about anything else this year, but like I said, things, things pop up, offers get made, so you never know. Um, and as far as myself, what I'm doing currently, um, I, I now play for a guy named Tim Montana who's a, a country artist. Um, and I actually um, have a 5 a.m. bus call, so I'm kind of mid-packing right now for it. Um, but we are heading out to play um, Travis Pastrana's 4th of July party this weekend, so. We're safe in assuming that's outdoors, considering? <laughs> yes, okay. yeah, yeah, okay. in, uh, in Maryland. Okay, yeah. all right, good. Uh, kind of... Uh made it very publicly clear that i think indoor shows at this point are like, oh no no this is this is acoustic in a park where people will be apart and they won't be yeah nothing nothing that's gonna get us uh torn apart like chase rice or anything good good I do, good i do have a, a big question for you though because you, you know you, you kind of started out you know playing in the you know i'd say you know rock you know pop punk kind of scene uh you know, going from that, and, and like I know you played with like Hundred Handed, uh, you know, a while ago. You know, that was you know big. That's all that was was pop music. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're playing with with this cat. You know, that's like just country rock. Like how how do you get into that? Like all of a sudden just switch to that. Like how'd you get hooked into that? Um. Well, I get I get lucky. I think people see me play and they know kind of if you see me live I, I like to move around and I, I'm energetic when I play and I kind of have been lucky that all of the bands that I've been with even if they've been on the poppier side or country um, when it's played live um, the rock side of everything gets played up and so usually that's where I can kind of get my rocks off is when we're playing live. Cause yeah, we kind of turn it up a little bit. Um, but as, I mean, I kind of, when I first came to Nashville, it wasn't to play country music. It was because every Avenue moved down here. Um, so it, it, the transition was a little weird. Um, there was definitely, um, a point where I was just like, I didn't know if I felt it that much. Um, and I got very, very fortunate um, when I started, when I was moving back from Los Angeles um, and coming back to Nashville to try to give it another go here. Um, my buddy hit me up and was just like, I got this guy, Tim Montana, like it's country, but it's like ZZ Top ish country and I was like all right all right this is something I can I can do this and it's not you know yeah. and I think now that I've been around it so much more um 
I've come to appreciate the music so much more, especially like older, like outlaw country, um, or even some of the more pop stuff from like the nineties. Like I can kind of go back to and listen to now, like, all right, I can dig this a little bit. Like um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Gar- the Garth Brooks. Yeah, man. So there's, there's some stuff that I'm like, I could see when this is played live, they probably tear it up and that would be like fun to watch. So it's like, you know, you can connect to it on that level at least. To yourself playing Shania Twain, you feel like a woman? Dude, I can feel like a woman. <laughs> look, look, country music literally put food on my family's plate for the first 14 years of my life. Like my dad was a DJ at W4 Country in Detroit. All right. So, and end up being creative director. So it's like, you know, the country now is, is obviously very different from the 80s and early 90s, but much respect. And yeah, you oh, mentioned yeah. Garth Brooks, he changed the game. You're talking about flipping different genres and whatnot, you know, playing one thing or another. Uh, we also, you know, our group goes between different genres. We try to, you know, say genres be damned, but uh, we may have yeah. uh, country tinge stuff up our sleeve soon. We shall see. Uh, so Something that Steve wanted to bring up uh, was Nashville experienced something a, a few months back that uh, was pre-COVID, uh, uh, but also natural. Uh, yeah, you guys, uh, yeah, you guys got hit by those tornadoes. Uh, oh yeah, you know that kind of that kind of uh, messed you up down there. And you know, glad glad that you were safe. I remember you know messaging you to see if you're all right, and uh, you know a few other people I know down that way. Uh, yeah it um and you're alive <laughs> yeah yeah me too uh, um yeah I'm, I'm fortunate i um was not hit my apartment was was not damaged but i'm two blocks away from uh basement east which is the the picture that everyone shows when you know any of the news articles for this it was the the building that looked like a bomb went off in the middle of it. That was two blocks from, from my apartment. So I'm pretty fortunate, um, you know, to even be here, let alone to be here and have like no damage, nothing have happened. But um, yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. Um, And then to have the world stop about, you know, 10 days after that happened, um, you know, kind of right in the middle of the real cleanup efforts, um, kind of threw everything. And it's weird. It hit the north and east side of the city. So if you are down in the southern part of town or the western part of town, it didn't affect you at all. And most people have no idea if they haven't gone into these areas that um, some of them are still messed up um where i am on the east side um there were a lot of volunteers that came immediately to to help at least with the cleanup um but there are areas in the north side of the city if you drive through it it like it looks like it happened a few days ago like it's still off of the streets but it's still all in the yards and the roofs are still you know you're just like it's crazy just because nothing has been able to go on so so it's like how neighborhoods in Detroit still look. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. How's how's the, how's the community dealing with this right now in Nashville? I mean, as best as they can. Uh, we are a city that makes a lot of its money on live music and live entertainment in general. Um, and tourism and restaurants and bars and basically none of those industries are making any money right now so um it's kind of hard to see the immediate effects yet um but i think that in the next few months um you know especially if unemployment is not extended um you could see a lot of musicians um, you know, being kicked out of their apartments or being homeless or, you know, this could be a, a big issue if, um, you know. Have you ever been homeless? Uh, for a short bit when I was in uh, Richmond, I was uh, living out of my van, yeah. Um, 
and sleeping behind a, uh, a food lion or outside of people's houses or just crashing on floors where I could. Um, but that was a, it was like a different type of homeless. Like I had a working vehicle and I had parents that I could have easily called. You know what I mean? That it was, it was like, I want to do this on my own. So I'm going to do this uh, very different type of thing than someone who's forced into that situation with nowhere else to turn. Um, so yeah, things could get very weird here um, in the near future. I don't really know. What do you, what do you see then just, just based on the conversations you've had, just, you are a person who's lived a life. You, you've had the experiences you've had. You, you have the, the, the family and the friends and the colleagues that are part of your life based on the conversations you're having. Just what's, what's your best guess? What's, what's going to happen for the music industry? Um, you know, over the next three to six months to a year, you know, just, just where, where's your head at on all this? What's your take? There's no right or wrong answer. Just yours. I want to be positive um, and say that this is an industry that can be inventive and if it can't make money in the avenues that it did before, it'll pave new ways. But you also, like I was saying, could see, you know, where you're kind of your struggling acts, your smaller acts who don't have label backing or your, your um, musicians here in town who don't have a full-time gig with someone who are just kind of, you know, your hired gun, just picking up whatever job that they can. Um, you might see those people leaving town or just, you know, quitting music. Um, I could see a lot of that happening. People just going, all right, there's, there's no money in this right now. And I don't know when there is going to be again. Um, I hate to get too meta here and, 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 you know, but if, if the reason that you're going to quit music is because there's no money in it, is that a real musician? <laughs> yeah you're probably in the wrong industry to begin with but yeah i mean no well no there's money in music of course you know there are people who thrive there you know and and like any other industry you know there's the top one percent in and yeah. you know they're paying for everybody else essentially right you know the justin timberlakes are financing you know the the indie labels and that are yeah. the subsidiaries of the majors and whatnot but I, I get your point. I get your point that there are, there are career musicians and there are professional musicians that have depended on th these income sources related to their career. And, and those have, mm -hmm. those have evaporated in an instant. Um, and they've been in, in situations where they're, especially in speaking specifically in the United States or they're 1099, they're, they're independent contractors and therefore, and based on the money they make, they don't qualify for, uh, you know, the affordable care act. And, and mm -hmm. so they're, uh, my protege, uh, is, is the tour manager front of house, uh, mixer for I prevail. Oh, you All know, right. Josh, Josh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, Josh Sobeck, wake up. Uh, yeah. so, um, his next 15 to 18 months of income have, has just been blown up. He's had to figure out how to manage this, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you know, that hits close to home for me. Uh, at the same time, there are a lot of independent musicians that have built their own business that they're still maybe getting 1099, but they are, they are operating in a way where they are the kings of their own little mini empires and, and they figure it out how to, for lack of a better term, I guess, play the game in a way that, that other musicians haven't. So I look at somebody like, and I know he's mega successful, but like a chance, the rapper, for example, yeah. okay? someone who has famously gone his own way, built his own uh, 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 empire, his own business with his own team and, and is independent calls his own shots type of guy. You know, I don't see a guy like that complaining not, and, not, yeah. and not, not complaining, but, but being Struggling. grossly negatively affected by this entire situation. Right. So is it, yeah. is it a matter of, of, 
I, I don't know. I guess, I guess, is it a thing of, you know, I don't know. Save me here. Save me here. Cause I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm stretching to find the, 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 the question where it's, there, there are there are some independent musicians that decide to go their own way, and then there are other independent musicians who decide to partner up with others. Where it's like, hey, you provide the resources and the infrastructure, we'll supply the content and the performances. Where yeah. other artists who have decided to embrace all aspects of the business and and carve out their own way, they're not feeling the effects as negatively because they're able to, frankly, they're able to expense things. On their on their tax returns that yeah. the independent contractors simply aren't. Does does that make sense? What are your thoughts? Yeah, totally. That? And I know totally. I yeah, I think that the artists that have figured out basically how to how to do this without needing a label, you know, how to market themselves and how to to do all those things. Those guys are going to survive. You know, they're going to make it through because they they're not relying on someone else to be in business basically they can do but this, this speaks to your point early like very early when we talked about the touring of self-reliance mm -hmm. it's huge so yeah you're yeah. piggybacking right on that continue sorry totally um i think my concern goes more for um let's just say you know because i'm a bass player your random average bass player here in town um they're looking for an artist to play with basically they're they're having to rely on someone else because there's not much of a market for solo bass players um now if you had that kind of brain where you could figure out how to market that fuck yeah dude like you'll be all right but i do think there are a lot of people that just because of what they do they have to rely on someone else and those are the things that are like that you worry about that like if say clear channel or uh or uh who's the ticket or whatever uh, who's the big live nation like i couldn't I, figure this out I say live nation doesn't do shows for the next year and then when they finally get around to it it's only the top tier artists who are getting booked you know you have this entire lower tier of artists who now are kind of fighting for scraps and there's only so much that's going to be able to go around sure sure and and not not that this is a debate we're just we're just talking about uh, oh I, totally i feel as though you know independent or lower tier artists as as you as you said have always been fighting for the scraps but but much like you know the some of the greatest chefs are poor people because they have to figure out how to make great tasting food out of crap out of nothing yeah right the independent artists and 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 you know the lower tier artists are always going to be fighting for their piece of the pie and and they're going to have to innovate and come up with new sounds and and push music into a, a, a new territory just like the the previous upstarts and and scrappers did right so oh, like, totally like, yeah i uh like prince you know taking different genres and melding them together and you know obviously pushing things forward in a controversial or provocative way by kind of being half of a cross dresser and all that stuff you know there's there's always an edge there's got to be an edge there right but you know these have being forced to innovate produces innovation you know that whole you know uh, necessity is the mother of invention type deal and and i think that's one of the good things that's come out of this this whole covid shutdown and, and reality check as it were is that people are 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 being forced to think outside of the box and and innovate and do things in a different way um business wise that is starting to prove out that innovation is being spurred that was being uh consciously ignored at worst and uh somewhat considered at best you know and so i i i i feel as though you know whenever we think it's going to be going to be terrible and it's going to shake out terribly for the little guy the little guy finds a way to outsmart the big guy at least that's for sure at, at least the little guys that are willing to fight so yeah for sure Absolutely. and you know um uh, art comes out of struggle a lot of times and there are a lot of ar artists who are currently struggling so you know you can only hope that we're going to get some awesomeness out of this you know so
Yes, Nina Simone uh, famously says, you know, an artist's duty is to reflect the times, right? Yep. So, um, to that point, I, I, this this is kind of not, it's not a wrap up question, but it's 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 a kind of a big one. I in a way, what advice do you have for for an aspiring musician in these times right now? As someone who has the passion, wants to get after it, and 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 put something out that that they're proud of. Let's see. Uh, don't be a dick. That's kind of my <laughs> my overall advice to everyone in life in general. Just don't be a dick, and you'll probably do all right. Um, no, I'm a firm believer in in hard work and in um, not giving up on yourself. Um, and I know that's pretty cliched, and it's the you know how do i do this oh work hard and it's like well that's the easiest advice to give but it's also probably the most true and that's why it's the easiest to give so it's easier said than done what uh yeah. what uh what would you say more for you know like a like a young bass player though trying to break out into the music scene you know because i you know from, from my standpoint you know you know as a bass player too it's that it that kind of is one of the the harder instruments to you know get into because there isn't a whole lot into it other than if you're just playing for like a group or, or playing for somebody that are, has a name for themselves. Yeah. Um, man, I don't know. Uh, find ambitious people to play with. <laughs> <laughs> it's honestly, that has been something that I, I've been extremely fortunate through my entire uh, playing career is I've been able to be around people who – were aspiring to do bigger things. And when I wasn't, I was able to recognize that and then move into different situations. Um, yeah, and that doesn't big, seem that's a big part of it. Yeah. And it doesn't seem like you, you know, you, you had a, uh, you know, through your whole career so far, it doesn't seem like you, you know, you're afraid to move on to the you know next level or you know, obviously yeah, it's, yeah, you moved around, you know, state different States and, you know, you're like, ah, oh, this isn't working out, you know, gotta get out of here, um, you know, and then move on to the next thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, man, like is, you, the grit you know when something's not right, and it's just kind of acknowledging that this is the situation, and usually once you do that, you kickstart the next, uh, the next phase of whatever you're doing, so. Yeah. Where, where does the grit come from for you? Why, why you, you know, you, you mentioned that, that you got the notion that, hey, I could be a musician because the, if these two guys are doing it, how, how, does it, how does it blossom into this grit where, like, as Steve said, you're willing to transplant your, your residence, you know? With the, how, how, we all need more than our own fingers and toes to count the number of musicians that we know that are not willing to leave the comfort zone of a 20 mile radius of where they were born or raised oh, yeah. in order oh, yeah. to pursue their dreams. Oh yeah. Making necessary sacrifices and taking calculated risks to go to the next level, giving, giving up in order to go up. Talk. I like where, where Steve's head is at with this. Talk about where this grit comes from, why the resiliency, especially out of a, a, a purpose or passion that was born very nascently because your, your story, quite frankly, Matt, is very, very different from mine. And this is not about my story. It's about yours. But quite frankly, I, as you said, my dad, like I said, worked in radio, you know, when yeah. I, from the time I was born, your mom's a singer, my mom's a singer and a dancer, like music was my whole life. So I've always had this in my, in my mind since I was like two years old of I'm, I'm a musician, I'm, I'm a drummer, da, 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 da. Your story is a little different. So why the grit? Because I have also moved across country, but I think that th that what Steve brought up, you're you're much more willing to just up and jump and up and jump wherever it takes you. Why the grit? Why music? And why does it mean that much to you that you would do that? I think I'm so willing to do those things because I saw kind of right from the beginning that if you did those things, if you were willing to, you know, like, like I said, with driving in an hour and a half from Taylor up to Port Huron, 
and you know this is when I was like 19 I think something like that so all of my friends are going to Canada and getting wasted and I want to be doing that but I have to drive up for an hour and a half of band practice of shitty songs and then drive back but you do that and then were you were you the songwriter <laughs> god i act uh, a few of the songs yes i was so i'm allowed to say that um but you do that for a little while and then you go and you play a show and it's awesome and you're like oh okay so you, you see right there you put in the work and then you get this and then that just builds and builds and you see the longer you do it the more you see people that aren't willing to do that and how quickly they kind of fall away. And it's just like, all right, I have to constantly be prepared to do whatever is that thing that I need to do next, because, you know, that's what's going to get me where I want to be, I guess. Are you going to give up? No, I don't see it happening. <laughs> it's been, I, um, good question. Good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a, a fallback. This is this is what I'm good at. And uh, this is kind of all that I've known now for 15 years, 16 years, something. Um, so yeah, this is what I want to do. It's what I'm going to do. What, what do you think of these virtual concerts or, you know, these, you know, hey, someone's performing in their spare bedroom concerts or, you know, do you see that... Uh have you done any of those you see, or, or even virtual concerts like with these holograms you know like we, we i don't i don't know how i feel i like listen if it's if you're entertained by it then that's great i'm not going to tell you what you should or shouldn't be entertained by however i don't think that there is anything that can duplicate that feeling of being at a show and live music and a band putting out energy and all just this barrage of frequencies and then you giving it right back the crowd with their energy and it's this reciprocal yeah. thing that's this awesome i i don't know if that can be replicated um you know virtually or through a hologram do you see However, like it would be awesome to go see a hologram of like a tupac show or something like that'd be pretty cool but. <laughs> Do you see yourself, uh, uh, you know, playing with um, uh, Tim, uh, you know, you guys doing that in the near future? Uh, you know, maybe not the whole hologram thing, but, uh, <laughs> you know, do, doing like a, a, like a Zoom uh, show kind of thing or something. I mean, yeah, I could definitely see something like that happening. Um, it might be weird. Um, I hope that that's not something that becomes the norm. Um, but if that's what has to be done so that musicians can play and fans can watch live music, I mean, I'll do it. You know, what, what do you, okay. What do you think music fans want right now? And I'm going to, I'm going to append this with the fact that being in certain musician groups on certain social media platforms as I am, uh, I see, I see indoor shows being advertised, and and some music fans just being so eager to go to a, a live show that, even though here in Michigan the governor has has just put out an order saying, hey, bars are essentially bars are closing again, and there are bars that have been using, uh, there are bars that can host live music that have been saying, oh, we're a bar above all and that that way we can host live music right not not getting into the politics of it but what do you think fans want like true fans of music what do they want right, i think people right i think people are starving for live entertainment right now um in any in any form or you mean live up close and in person I think up close and in person um i think people will take what they can get right now so if it's something that's done virtually then okay yeah that, i guess that's what we're doing but i think i can only speak for myself but from what i see i think people still want to go out and experience live music and have that entire thing going on 
Um, do you think? Do you think most music fans want to do that right now at the expense of controlling what's going on? Like, I, I, I not. I don't know if if they know, they want, want to do it, you know, more than they want to take care of the people around them. Um, but I do think that. I mean, you saw, you know, everyone's mad at at chase rice for playing that show but you know all of those people had to go and play i don't know from i don't know from chase rice pardon my ignorance audience oh uh he played a show last weekend and and uh depending on where you read it uh, anywhere from a thousand to four thousand people were in attendance and and packed in without masks and i mean judging from that people want to see shows i mean they were willing to go and do that so I, I do think that I don't care if grandma dies six months earlier <laughs> yeah. than, than she's supposed to. I need I mean, peace rice. It's it's a big it's a big issue down here right now. Um, is it, is it, it? It does it, go to show that that people want to want to see shows. So I mean, is it a big issue because of you say down here being in Nashville? Is it a big issue because of the industry, or is it a big issue because? Uh, it's probably more magnified because of the industry because he's a country artist and it happened in East Tennessee. So it kind of is, you know, all kind of centralized here. Um, but I think it, it's more because he's the first artist that really has done a big show with this many people coming out to it, at least in Tennessee that I know of. Sure. Um, so I think that's, what's been the biggest cause of the uproar but um steve what other uh what other things you want to pick matt's brain about because i have i have some other stuff i want to get into i want to rapid fire some stuff at him but uh want to make Ooh. sure that you you've got your thoughts are you out. playing a game are we playing a game life all of life is a game it's all good yeah. um no i don't i mean i don't have any like uh main questions i mean uh just something that i was just thinking of uh, you know, you talking about that, uh, or who, who was it down in, in Tennessee that, that played the show? Uh, Chase Rice. Okay. Like, for me, I don't – he might be, you know, significant, you know, in the country artist. But, like, to me, I don't think that was a significant artist to, like, uh, you know, put, put yourself in the position that, oh, I might get sick. Uh What's, yeah, there have what been, is your personal take on that, though? He, he wasn't. There so have been people hurting. making jokes about that. Um, which, whatever. I mean, he has fans. There are people out there that love him. So, I mean, I don't know. I I can't see any shows that I would want to go and be in a crowd to see right now. Um, I don't know when I personally will want to to do that again that's my next um, question is is when do you think it, when are what are the metrics for you what what is the benchmark for you matt black of i'm going to be comfortable going to a general admission concert again i tend to not like them anyway <laughs> i i'm not a fan of being in big crowds i get you know, very you know, claustrophobic you know, you know i'm saying i'm saying just as a human being just, just um, take your I think, proclivities out of it for a second. Just when would you, as a, as a general, just as a human being, when would you be comfortable going to it? I think when, when you see an actual, not just a momentary, uh, momentary uh, steadiness of numbers or decline in numbers, but an actual prolonged steadiness or decline in numbers, um, when things look like we're actually getting past, that's when I think, I mean, I've, I've been out to a restaurant once since they've reopened. It's been a month. Um, um, I just, until it's, it's like fully kind of passed, I, I feel like I'm better off at home. But, um, but yeah, I, I think once it's kind of past this initial, I guess not even initial anymore, but the, the spiking phase, <laughs> I don't know. It's a rapid okay. spike right now. No, I, I, we're both with you. When when the science and data uh, demonstrate safety, yes, then we'll get yeah. after it. Not safety with 
such and such precautions. Like you got to wear this, you got to stand here, you got to wash yeah. this, you got to n- not make eye contact with this. You have to hold your breath during these times. No, no. Stand on one foot. Yeah. Right. Right. Turn around, touch your nose, chew gum, pat your head. No, we're good. Hey, if I can spin the prices right wheel, everything's fine. Yeah. Um, right. Who, before I get into some of these rapid fires, um, the title of the podcast being who let you in here, who's the one person you'd like to shout out that really helped take you to the next level in your musical career? I would say probably Brian Robillard. Um, who who was why? the cousin who is he and why is he so So, uh, brian is uh the cousin of the singer of the band for the taking that i was in in uh port huron in 2004 whenever that was um and he was the guy who kind of hooked me up with the band that I initially toured with, he had started managing them. He convinced them to take me on the road for my first tour. And then he um, kind of set up the meeting for me with Race the Sun, the band in uh, Richmond that I was in for a little while, um, and stuck around and tour managed that band for a year and a half, something like that. But he was extremely influential and um, I feel like without him opening some of those initial doors for me, like I would have never even, well, I don't want to say I'd never even, cause like you said, I'm a pretty driven person. I would have figured out some way, but um, yeah, he opened a lot of doors for me. So. I can no longer hear you. I think you may be muted. Let's try that again. Oh, oh hello. There you go. There you go. I, 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 was, I was saying it was a great job. You look very nice today. Uh, uh, oh? No, I'm going to. Thank, uh, thank you. We got a little bit left <laughs> here. We got a little bit left here. So uh, uh, I want to do a, a few rapid fires. Uh, how do you relax? What's uh, Marijuana. Oh, okay. <laughs> how often that, is that? That was quick. <laughs> oh, it's rapid fire, right? <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, okay. No. Um, uh, yeah, I, um, I like to smoke. I like to read, um, as you can see. Um, no, I yeah, went out and got you, these uh, today. This is simply a prop behind me. Yeah, it's a green screen. What are you, what are you currently <laughs> the whole reading? Shelf. What are you currently the whole reading shelf. right now? Um, I am reading a book of short stories by Kelly Link. Um, and I just finished a book called Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. Um, They made a movie, it came out a few years ago with Natalie Portman, and I don't think it did very well, but- The book um, was better? The book's insane. Yeah, really, really good. Um, Mostly mostly a fiction reader then? For the most part, um, and I'm kind of all over the place. Um, Like I could go anything from, you know, old Russian classics to like, you know, horror and kind of everything in between fantasy, sci-fi. And yeah, I have a bit of everything. Reading is good. Reading is fun. It is. It's fun. Like it. uh, this is a two-part question. Who is the most influential person in your life? Okay, that's number one. And then the second part is, of all the lessons this person ever taught you, if they were all written on little pieces of paper and in a bag, and you could only save one of them before that bag was set on fire, what would that lesson be? So who's the most influential person in your life? And what is the one lesson you would want to keep from them? I would say the most influential person in my life has probably been my brother. If I'm going throughout my entire life, And the best advice that he probably ever gave me was don't do what I did. (laughs) It's the, uh, the perks of having an older brother who was the problem child. (laughs) He tried it out. He did everything. 
but he's he's good now so it's a uh, i can make jokes about it but <laughs> that's great that's great yeah um, and if Jer- if jeremy sees this how you doing <laughs> oh he'll love it he'll be very stoked that you said that tell us about a time when you truly suffered in your life and what you learned from it man i have been extremely fortunate through my life where I, I can't, man. I mean, the fact that I can't really think of anything of any like extreme, extreme suffering that I've gone through tells you a lot. Oh man. I don't know. I don't have any good, any good, like, (laughs) Anything that I would that I would say pales in comparison to most your most average people have gone through way more shit than I have. I feel like I, th- I remember when your neon caught on fire. <laughs> that, that just sounds like an incident. That's that's the fun. night the night that my Dodge neon caught on fire. Um, quite the hardship that I had to endure. Um, the night the neon died. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll move on then. What What would you say is up to now the defining moment in your career or your personal life? In terms of kind of like cool, full circle, like childhood dream that I kind of got to live out um, when I was, I was living in uh, Los Angeles. I always point behind me when I talk about some place I used to live. I'm noticing this watching myself on the camera. When I was back there, whatever direction that is in Los Angeles, um, I got to be uh, my band hundred handed. Um, we got to be guests on Monday night raw. Um, and I was a just huge wrestling dork and when i say was i mean i just watched wrestling this morning don't let me fool you i still love it um just so obsessed when i was a kid and um that was definitely one of the one of the coolest things i've gotten to be a part of like going around um it was at staples center and we got to go all through the back areas and meet all the wrestlers and i got to hang out with rick flair and chris jericho and it was pretty wild did you get, get a to do a woo? That's <laughs> the same thing. Did you get a woo? Oh, I wooed. I didn't, I didn't make contact. I felt like that would have been disrespectful. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, that, that was pretty wild. All right. We got, we got uh, about 45 seconds here, and we got two questions. First one, just no right or wrong answer, just yours. Define success. Happiness. Oh, I lost you. Muted again. again. What is happiness to you? Oh, usually I can just say happiness, and then I get it. I'm done with it. Um, you don't get off that easy. <laughs> Man, I don't know. I don't think anyone could ever be fully like worry free or stress free, but feel like uh, doing what you love in life and making a living at it and being around the people that you love. That seems like a, would make me happy, I guess. <laughs> that would be my personal definition of happiness, I guess. What's, what's on your plate for like the next 90 days? What are you getting after? 90 days. Um, well, I have a, uh, a move the beginning of August. I'm uh, moving to another spot in East Nashville. Um, and then basically uh, hoping that shows kind of in one form or another um, come back so I can start doing that and stop being a delivery driver. <laughs> are, you, are you creating at all? Are you? Uh, like, do you, are you just, pardon my, ignorance, you know, I'm, I'm not for hire. I mean, I'm not much of a, a songwriter. Um, I, so I do, I don't do much creating as far as that goes. My creative outlet, I, I paint, um, 
So I've kind of been doing more of that um, as this has happened. Steve, um, why don't you but, do uh, a painter? <laughs> I didn't know. No. This is true. This we're gonna is have true. we're gonna have an offline conversation. This is the first. <laughs> this first I'm hearing about it. It's why uh, yeah. That it's, it's, it's not like a thing that it's like uh, I'm I'm great at or anything, but. That's uh, that's kind of more my creative outlet is through that rather than music I like because it's someone else does all of that legwork and then I can just kind of play along with it. Where can people find you or reach you if if they want to connect or follow the projects that that you are involved in? Just just yes. Don't um, talk. Don't talk about the platforms that you don't engage on. Maybe maybe just maybe just the ones that you do. That's probably a good idea. Um, yeah, if uh, especially like for a painting or something, if you would wanted to get a hold of me, um, Instagram would be the best way to do that. It's just at Matthew Daniel Black. Um, and then if you want to check out what I'm currently doing musically, uh, TimMontana.com, um, Tim Montana on Instagram, basically on anything social, just Tim Montana um, on iTunes, Spotify. Like, give it a listen. It's good shit. Awesome. All right. Well, Matt, thank you very, very much for uh, being our first guest, first of all, and for taking the time to uh, experience some of the Zoom recording growing pains that we're going through. <laughs> and uh, just, uh, yeah, just, just being honest and being authentic. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to talk to uh, someone who is just a genuine human being. Well, thank I, you, sir. I, I appreciate you guys. Appreciate you guys having me on. It's it's uh, been a very cool thing to be a part of. So, right on, right on. We shall uh, we shall hope to grow it, and uh, we'll see you on the flippy flop. Yes, sir. All right. Have a good one, Matt. All right, boys. Good first foray. Good uh, good first conversation. Uh, Matt was open and interesting. What did you think? Yeah, it was good. Good. It was good. Yeah. Care to elaborate? I agree on what you said. Could have said it better than myself. Folks, I don't just look for a yes man. I, I, I look for an opinion. I look for feedback. I look for contrary points of view. All Steve has to say is, oh, it was great. It's fine. It's fine. No, it was great. Speaking of great, I have great news. I was going through my old emails. Okay. By old, I mean like almost 10 years ago. I got a big inbox to clean up. And I stumbled on this one that was from a fan who is now a bullfighter, Sandy. Uh, she said, Dear Mr. K, let me start by saying that I am a huge fan. Recently, I have been listening to a podcast called Guys We Fucked. I'm dead serious. I did not make that up. This is this is from November of 2016, by the way. Okay. Yeah. This this is a while ago. This is how old the emails are that are in my inbox. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh yeah. I'm dead serious. I did not make that up. The guys we fucked podcasting. They are always looking for songs to feature on the show, and I think dealing with people would be so awesome to hear on the show. The email for them is the email address. I don't know if it is even something you would be interested in or not. Thank you for your time, Sandy. Sandy has always been very polite and very nice, not just in November of 2016, but her entire time as a fan and a bullfighter. So going through my inbox, I find this. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I didn't respond to it. I didn't even see this, and I've heard about this podcast. So I forwarded her email to the Guys We Fucked podcast, and I said, hello, I'm currently cleaning out my overloaded email inbox and stumbled on an email from a fan who recommended that I send you my music to play on your podcast, of which I've heard nothing but good and funny things over the past few years. If you're still accepting submissions for the show, I humbly offer our tunes. The one recommended by our mutual friend is dealing with people, which can be found on your platform of choice, blah, blah, blah. There's the links and all that stuff. Got an email 
uh, what time is it? Uh, 20 minutes ago. Hi, John. Going to use dealing with people and hate you back on tomorrow's episode. We'll send paperwork along shortly. Thanks, Mike. I don't know what who Mike is in relation to the podcast, but apparently uh, he answers this, this email. And not only is he going to use a song that she recommended, but another one. Sweet. That's, that's pretty dope. That is amazing. Stoked. Stoked. Dudes, dudes be fucked. <laughs> oh, no, guys. Guys. Oh, guys. Got it, Got it wrong. wrong. Damn it. So, all in all, a very, very good night. Sweet. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for paying attention. Uh, <laughs> and uh, being a part of this, the inaugural. We will, uh, we're going to figure it out as we go along. And if you go along with us, help us figure it out. Take care. Ta-ta. Bye-bye. Oh,